Thank you. Good afternoon. Thanks for sticking around. Uh, this topic is, is really about what patients are thinking and saying when they come in and say, how, how bad is it going to be, doc, or how bad is my disease, or what do I have to think about for the future? And this differentiation between disease severity and disease activity is really important because they're different concepts that we use interchangeably, and I think our patients might use interchangeably. And it confuses things when you're prescribing medications that are indicated for moderate to severely active disease. And I'll tell you why I think that's so different and why it's important to make that difference in your mind and to your patients. So we'll talk about to understand the difference between disease activity and disease severity, and then talk about this idea of prognosis and how can we help our patients understand what the future might look like for them, which I would argue is much more important than what their symptoms are today. Thinking about what's happening next and in the future and preventing complications is where we really need to be thinking. You're all familiar with these because we talk about them all the time at meetings and in clinical trials and in retrospective observational cohorts when we try to calculate somebody's disease activity. And many of you, I bet, even either give out surveys and answer, have patients answer questions or you rate your patients at visits using these types of indices that are helpful to an extent, but what they're only talking about really is the cross-sectional assessment of today and what their activity of their disease is at that visit or perhaps within the past two weeks. Where the concept of disease severity is about this longitudinal disease course. What has their disease been like for them in the past, currently now, and what might it be in the future? And really what you're thinking about is how are you today versus what has been your disease course now and what could it be in the future to help us make a decision about therapy. Disease severity is what I, I think we think about when you review their history and you've gone through this big stack of papers when they're coming into the office and you're preparing for a new patient visit and you think to yourself, is this a patient with not so bad uncomplicated disease or is this somebody who's had bad disease? And I would think that that gestalt that you're putting together in your mind of what their disease has been like is far more important when making decisions of what you're going to put them on now. Because again, getting patients better immediately isn't that hard. We have bad drugs for it, like corticosteroids, but we have great response rates to get our patients' disease activity down. The thing that we struggle with is preventing the progression of disease severity, and that's where we need to be better. So just to reemphasize this point, this is a patient with varying disease activity. At a moment in time, early on, this is where their disease activity is. This is what their symptoms are. And of course, in between these flares and then during other flares, their disease is getting worse over time and they're getting more and more complications until you get to a point that the medications won't work. It was too late to start them on medications because we've missed that window of opportunity. To show you that this patient here has the same disease activity at that office visit, they had the same disease activity as the patient before, but their course can be very different such that they don't have significant flares over time, they never progress, and sorting these patients out is incredibly important because the first patient should be on intensive therapy that we follow very, very closely and give them our best drugs, where this patient you can get away sometimes with either no medications or simpler medications that might be even used as needed. So we have to sort this out, and it's very hard to tell who's who at that very first visit. It's not just Crohn's disease, and we do have to think about this. It's ulcerative colitis as well. Ulcerative colitis is also a damaging progressive disease, but it's not as obvious to us. We don't see the strictures and the perforations. We think that if somebody has a stricture with ulcerative colitis, it must be cancer, and we take their colon out. Well, in fact, that's not the case all the time, and it's sometimes, many times, damage from persistent inflammation that we didn't recognize until it was too late. Proximal extension of disease is a problem because once those patients start with left-sided disease and then extend, it's more than just, oh, now they need oral medications. But we found over the past couple of years in abstracts that were presented at DDW and now getting published that these patients actually have more refractory disease and they're difficult to treat. We've talked about the problem with stricturing. Pseudopolyposis, of course, in itself isn't a big problem, but when you're surveying them and one or two of them come back adenomas, then you're really stuck and you have a very hard time and we're taking colons out sometimes because we simply can't survey them because of long-standing, undertreated disease that led to scarring, pseudopolyps, and a very difficult colon for us to assess. 
When your patients are coming in who have a completely healed colon and you're saying to them, oh, I don't know what your symptoms are from, they're not from your suit, you see you must have IBS also, well, that may be the case, but many of them also have dysmotility and anal rectal dysfunction because of the long-standing inflammatory damage. So again, we're waiting too long in both Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, and it's leading to symptoms that are very difficult to treat and aren't going to respond to our medications that we give them too late. The problem is our most effective drugs the biologics are indicated only for patients with moderate to severely active disease. But when a patient comes in with a complex history and has low disease activity, not only do we have a false sense of security for us as providers, if, if you looked through their chart and said, oh boy, this is a patient who's been really sick over time, but thank goodness that they're doing fine now and we don't have to do too much, and you might be compelled to leave them on five ASAs or leave them on whatever medication they're on, not recognizing the fact that their disease severity could be much more complex, and we have to think further about what to do to prevent these things from getting worse in the future. And also patients, when they feel okay, don't feel like they deserve biologics. They don't feel like they're sick enough to get these drugs. So again, just relying on activity can be very confusing, and certainly payers don't think that our patients need them unless they're sick enough to get them. So we have to think about disease severity in a couple of different domains. And one way is the impact on the patient. That's what we see. Those are their symptoms, their quality of life, fatigue, disability, parts that are directly impacting the patient. But we have to recognize that a complicated disease course goes into this formula, as does their inflammatory burden. And you have to think about the realm of the different aspects of their disease, again, as opposed to what we typically do is focus on the top, top part, which are their symptoms and what to do with them at the time. Every patient has a unique mix of these characteristics and both Crohn's disease are progressive disorders and therefore disease severity will also be a progressive disorder. One way to get at this was working with the group to develop an overall disease severity index to help us be on the same page and on the same playing field as what do we mean by bad disease versus not so bad disease. And the idea was to think about two different patients and how we put in our minds of what their disease severity is. So this patient here you see is asymptomatic but has extensive small bowel disease and moderately active endoscopic lesions. So their inflammatory burden is high, their complex disease course could be high, but the impact on the patient is actually very low. And you can imagine seeing this patient in the office and not being compelled to push them on more intensive or more optimized therapy if they're feeling fine, but that's not good enough. The other is an isolated short ileal segment with disabling obstructive symptoms. We can talk about a two or three centimeter segment here. So there's a very low inflammatory burden, already a complicated disease course, but huge impact on the patient. So we have to think about these different aspects when we're trying to size up who's who and what the patients are dealing with. The different attributes that we did when we developed this project were looking at Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis separately. And you can see here that these were the variables that we wanted to look at in way of what was more important when you're really thinking about overall disease severity. It can't all be weighed equally. Certainly, there are going to be some factors that are more important than others when we're trying to put together this picture, this composite of what our patient looks like as far as their overall disease severity. So here's how the Crohn's disease rankings worked out. And I don't show this so that you know the order of all of them, but to make a point that Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis were really different. That for Crohn's disease, the most important factors were focused on the damage that the disease has caused or could cause, where for ulcerative colitis, it was much more about how the disease was affecting them and their day-to-day -day living, where the doctors who took part of this really recognized the fact that we have to think about the damage that has already occurred in Crohn's and again is giving us a window into the future of where further damage can be. Here you can see with ulcerative colitis that again, although mucosal lesions was the most important for Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, for ulcerative colitis it was really much more shifted on the day-to-day -day impact on their lives as, it was, as opposed to what it was for Crohn's disease. So you can look at this paper that was in gut over the past year and what, what it ultimately gives you is a score from zero to 100 of how severe the patient's disease is, which to me seems to be a helpful thing to understand. So you really have in the front of your mind, is this a patient who we need to worry about? about, or is this somebody who's actually going to do just fine if we just keep a close eye on them and make sure their disease does not progress? But I'm not suggesting that you score every patient in the clinic every time they come in. What I would ask you to do is at least recognize the difference and think about this in your mind and talk to your patients about it, that to recognize that activity and severity is different. Activity is what guides that next move. It's what you're going to do today to get them feeling better 
where their overall disease severity is really guiding the strategy. And this is how I talk to my patients about this, that we need to take care of you right now, but even more importantly, we need to think about what the next three, five, or 10 years are gonna look like for you, and that's why I wanna put you on effective medications, not because I'm worried how the next three days are gonna go, but possibly because the next three days or, or next three years might look for them. So you could try out the overall disease severity index. Again, it was just published in gut, but at least think about their overall experience of their disease and acknowledge to your patients that even if you feel well today, we have to be very careful about what we're thinking about for the future. So the other side of this is their prognosis. And this is what our patients are thinking when they come in, whether they verbalize it or not, they wanna know how bad is it? Do I have bad disease or do I have not so bad disease? Am I gonna be okay or am I gonna be like one of these people I see on the internet who's writing about how horrible it is to live with these diseases? And the fact is it's hard for us to tell. Sometimes it's easy, but it's not only hard for us to tell, it's hard for us to communicate that to our patients. And we've all had this experience that you know somebody's going to do poorly or you're very worried that they're gonna do poorly, but they don't feel that bad and it's really hard for you to explain to them. And when you're trying to explain to patients what the future prognosis or course of their disease is going to be, if they're not feeling so sick and don't recognize the MRI findings that you're looking at or the colonoscopy findings you're looking at or, or seeing how things look overall, it's really hard to get them to buy into the fact that you want them to go on medications that have side effect profiles as they're listed on the package inserts that come along with the medications they're using. So we can't fix the damage in IBD, and that's something, again, that I'm not sure our patients are totally comfortable with, that they feel like they need to earn these medications by being sick enough. But we all know that if we wait too long, none of our medications, at least to date, fix fibrosis or fix damage. We have anti-inflammatory medications to prevent these complications, not fix the complications. And again, that's something that we need to be very clear with our patients and make sure we help them understand that. Because it's simply not easy for them to see, and it's also not so easy for us to see. We need to stop chasing bad disease. This is typically what we do. We need to get out in front of inflammatory bowel disease, not wait until our patients are so sick with moderate to severely active disease, which is sometimes years in to their disease severity progressing over time. So there are a number of factors that people have looked at in this, and there are uh, uh, publications over the past 10 years of calling out prognostic factors, which are related to age, weight loss at diagnosis, where their disease is, endoscopic disease severity, whether they have perianal disease or not, which is an independent predictor of uh, intra-abdominal complications, uh, using steroids, whether they're smokers, and certainly looking at uh, markers like CRP, uh, serologic markers, and genetic markers. So what our goal was in the project that we've been working on now for just about 10 years and finally getting this to a point that we feel that we can use it in a clinical setting is to try to develop a model that we can take a patient who hasn't had a complication yet and risk stratify them to low, medium, or high risk of developing a complication within the next three years. And we had a big group with a couple of different patient cohorts to validate this in. And again, finally getting it to a point that we feel comfortable we can use this to help our patients make decisions. The way that this model started was about 700 patients with Crohn's disease, and we looked at all the factors that we felt contributed to the disease causing trouble over time or having a complication of their disease, a complication being defined as internal penetrating disease or stricturing disease or an intra-abdominal surgery, something that we believed were important for all patients to know and understand. Nothing too new came out of this. We found many of the same things that others had in the past. What was new is how we used this as a tool to show it to our patients, which I'll show you in a minute. But you can see the variables were disease location, certain serologic markers that we've seen before, and having a NOD2 variant. When we develop the model, when you develop any model, you need a calibration cohort, which is useful, but it doesn't tell you really if the model's gonna work in other patient populations. And if you're interested in these kind of statistics, a Harrell C or concordance index, something above 0 0.6, 0 0.65 is considered good, and we came out at 0.73, which made us happy. But again, it doesn't mean that much until you move it to other patient populations and test it in a completely different group of patients. And here, when we looked at other adult patients, it performed exactly the same way. And in fact, when we looked at pediatric patients, it also worked in that pediatric population. So the way we had to make the leap and make this something different and special is using this technique called system dynamics analysis so that we can use this as a tool to talk with patients. This isn't that different than multivariate logistic regression. But what it does is it allows us to provide a real-time individualized prediction 
of outcomes to somebody at that moment. So instead of showing them hazard ratios and statistical confidence intervals, which I think would be a very hard thing to try to talk to your patient with and showing them those data, it's a simple control panel where you dial in the results and then a graph that conveys this over time with the ability to add new data as we learn more in the field. So if more or newer genetic markers or serologic markers come, we can add them to this model and even make the predictive response more robust. Essentially what we've taken is complex clinical data and turned it into patient-friendly results so that we can sit with our patients and help them understand. This is what the model looks like when you put the, uh, uh, the statistical tool together. This was done like this for a number of different reasons. We had a series of focus groups talking with patients to have them teach us what was important for them to hear and learn. And you can see that it's color coded. In fact, the percentages on the y-axis were taken away because patients told us they didn't really care if it was 82% versus 69%. They simply wanted to know, are they at high risk or are they at low risk or somewhere in between? And also patients can look, it's personalized for them with their name on it, and it very specifically calls out what the complications are that we're working with. So it's great to work with patients, and the, there are customers and our end users here to understand exactly what we want it to look like. I just wanted to show you two examples because we've been using this both part of a randomized controlled trial to see how it influences patients, but also I've been using it in my clinic. This is one patient, a wonderful gentleman from Maine who's a musician who uh, is just getting his life and career going. He, he, in addition to the band he's in, he just started a, a recording studio that he personally put money into. And the fact that he was just recently diagnosed with something called Crohn's disease that he had no knowledge about was really disruptive to him. The confusing part was that although he had moderately active ileal disease that you would all agree was moderately active disease, he actually felt okay because he was being treated with the most commonly mentioned drug at this, this conference, I think, over the past few days was, was marijuana. And in Maine, it's available recreationally and it's easy for him to get. And he said, he came to me as a second opinion, not because nobody knew what to do for him, because he, quote, refused therapy and they wanted me to talk some sense into him to go on good, uh, uh, you know, good treatments that would make him better. And he came, and I'll admit he was a bit angry when he showed up, because he had no idea why he just drove four hours to be told that he needs to go on drugs that he already said he didn't want to go on. So we put him through the model, and you can see how he came out as far as his prediction of, of, of having a complication. This was based on his ileal disease status, high serologic markers, and having NOD2 positivity. And I tell you the truth when I say he called the very next day and talked to my nurse at 8.01 a.m. as soon as the phones opened and asked how quickly he can get on that therapy that the doctor talked to him about because now he was worried about his disease more so than he was worried about the side effects of his drugs. So in fact, we put him on Humira and methotrexate and then we rescoped him about 10 months later. I probably should have done it a little bit sooner. And he had complete mucosal healing. He's one of these patients who you, you wondered to yourself if he really even had Crohn's disease. It looked that good. And this is exactly what we're trying to do, is find patients early, treat them early, and make sure it's the appropriate patients. So conversely, here's a different patient. This is one of these amazing young women. She went to a university in Vermont where she played varsity soccer, held down two jobs, was incredibly busy, and did not want to be bothered by this new diagnosis of what she was told was Crohn's disease. Her endoscopic findings weren't quite is significant. She had mild to moderately active disease. She also came down, but this time she's angry at her local physicians who are, quote, forcing her to go on combination therapy because she had a new diagnosis of small bowel Crohn's disease. And she came down really upset that she had no options and she wanted to treat her disease naturally and exercise more and play more soccer. And she knew that would make her feel better. So we put her through our model as well, and you can see that it looked very different than our last patient. And again, I'm only showing you an N of two example here, but we've seen this a number of times and how it influences patients' decision-making. Decision so she also called me the next day, but this time with a different story. She said, see, I told you so. I don't need to be on anything. Can you just watch me over a period of a year or so and see how things go? And as I often tell patients, if I feel that we might be under-treating them, we might do some over-testing and follow their fecal calprotectin, follow their endo endoscopic findings. And in fact, we brought her back in about nine months later and performed a scope, and she had complete mucosal healing also. So people's Crohn's disease behave very differently, and we have a very hard time sorting these two patients out when you're seeing them in the office. And I'm not saying that a computer model takes away all of your decision making, but to use it as a tool in combination with your good sense and sensibility when you're talking to patients 
can be really, really helpful. And we found that it's very helpful. And in fact, in our prospective trial, where we're watching patients over time, you can see that patients are stratifying out just as we would have expected with more patients in the high-risk group having complications than patients in the other groups. What's interesting is about 80% of patients sort out as being moderate to high risk, where about 20% of patients are at low risk. So you could flip this entire model around and say, you know what, all we're really trying to do is pull out those low risk patients and perhaps not treat them and just follow them carefully or treat them symptomatically and see how they do as opposed to thinking that we have to use early intensive therapy in all of our patients. So in summary, disease activity is about a moment in time where disease severity represents this longitudinal summary of overall disease course, which again is much more important than how they're feeling at that moment. Crohn's disease severity is associated more with intestinal damage in contrast to UC disease severity, which is more dependent on symptoms and their immediate impact on their quality of life. And then finally, to re-emphasize this point, we simply need to stop chasing bad disease and we need to get out in front of it. And I'm not saying that the work that we're doing is the only way to do it. We together have to work as a field to find other techniques to find these patients, communicate with these patients, so we're all on the same team and not letting them get into trouble and then treating them, which we know is the wrong way to do it. So thanks again for having me.